Welcome back to video blog number 10. Today we're talking about psychedelics. And this is very timely because there has been a major conference on psychedelic in uh, Oakland, California, just in April of 2017. Psychedelics have made a comeback big time, not only in this country but also in the United Kingdom, which really has been instrumental in putting these kinds of medications back on the map. Interestingly, uh, Dr. Thomas Insel, the uh, former chief of the NIMH in Washington, D.C. at the National Institute of Health, who has uh, recently joined Google or Alphabet um, in the medicine department, uh, he has left NIMH to strike out in the private sector to further his goals of revitalizing psychiatry and neuroscience. Dr. Insel was in attendance at this meeting and participated in a panel where he outlined that psychiatry seems to be at a dead end. It's against a wall where there has been limited progress in the last 30 or 40 years. We are stuck with the same kinds of medications we are stuck with the same kind of treatment resistant and lack of enthusiasm on the part of the public towards psychiatry. Something new is needed. And in previous lectures, we have talked to you about the potential revolutionary impact of psychedelic drugs in tapping into processes and consciousness and in rapid uh, resetting of the brain, allowing for the treatment of treatment resistant depression, for example and other states such as post-traumatic stress disorder. So we are involved right now in, an, in a series on consciousness and how the brain instantiates consciousness. Here is a new paper that I'll be presenting today that deals with the connection between consciousness and the impact of psychedelic drugs on consciousness. It's a very intriguing convergence of themes that has happened here. And I will introduce you slowly so you can understand the impact and the potential meaning of the paper that we will discuss towards the end of this talk. But first, we need to do some preliminaries so we can understand what this new paper is all about. Uh, we have done previous lectures on sleep, and I want to remind you here about what happens in sleep. In the first slide, you see that during sleep there is a breakdown of the cortical effective connectivity, meaning that uh, during non-rapid eye movement sleep, when you are really unconscious and not in a dream state, there is a, uh, a response uh, that is uh, different uh, to the normal waking response in the sense that uh, uh, parts of the, contact, the cortex are disconnected from each other. In other words, the um, signals in the brain le uh, lose complexity and uh, connectivity. In the next slide, you see how this is being tested. Now, this was work originally conceptualized by Dr. Massimini in Italy in uh, collaboration with Giulio Tononi from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Tononi has made uh, repeated uh, appearances already in our lecture series. So here is the idea. You stimulate the brain here with transmagnetic stimulation. You introduce a rapid magnetic pulse which triggers a small electrical storm in a regional brain area. And the response of adjacent areas is to reverberate. Uh, areas that are connected to the site of impact will be impacted, of course, by the sudden electrical disturbance in the field. And you can see how this reverberates over time into different brain regions, as shown here. So the signal migrates to different areas as the milliseconds elapse. So that is the test. This tests which areas are connected to which areas and at which level of complexity we will unravel the idea of complexity as we go along in the talk. And here in the next slide you see what happens during non-REM sleep. That sleep in which you are deeply unconscious. 
there is no activity going on uh, in your mind, you are basically gone from this world. When you do the transplanetic stimulation in this particular state, you can see that the signal remains local. It's not going anywhere because there is a decoupling of brain areas, brain areas that are connected to each other during conscious states are uncoupled during unconscious states. Here's another way of showing this. You see in wakefulness the reverberation waves migrating through cortical regions over time. Here is sleep stage one, light sleep, and here is non-REM deep sleep. You can see here the signal of the impulse accumulating on the left hand side and the complexity of this area is decreasing significantly. In the next slide uh, you see a summary, namely an intuitive distinction has usually been made between conscious level, how conscious, are, how conscious are you or how aware are you, and the various conscious contents that you can report on when somebody asks you what's going on in your mind. And usually studies have been addressing these issues separately. You remember we have done a lot of uh, slides on the idea of the minimal contrast between a stimulus that is perceived by the experimental subject and one that is not perceived. And we have uh, introduced you to the work of Stanislav Dehaney who has delineated in great detail uh, what happens in the brain, in the global workspace, when a stimulus is suddenly perceived. There is an explosion, an ignition in the global workspace which propagates or broadcasts a signal to widely distributed cortical areas. And in his view, that is the hallmark of consciousness or becoming consciously aware. However, this is not the same as vigilance or being alert and quote-unquote conscious. In the next slide, I show you how you can conceptualize this. So here you are right now as you listen to this talk. You are consciously awake. Your vigilance levels are high. Your eyes are open. You are paying attention. And you are, uh, you are aware of a great deal of highly differentiated uh, content as you listen to this talk. Now here you have other states of mind. For example, REM sleep. Now in REM sleep you are conscious, believe it or not. You have vivid dream experiences, but of course you are less vigilant. You are less awake and attuned to the environment. In fact, you are disconnected from the environment. And here you have another sleep stage, namely slow wave sleep, which is the deep sleep where nothing happens in your brain and you might as well be dead or deeply unconscious. Now here is general anesthesia and coma where there is zero vigilance and as far as we know zero content. So there are then these two dimensions of consciousness, vigilance and being conscious and the specific contents of your consciousness. Now, I need to introduce you to this particular measure that you encountered a few, a few slides back, which has since been formalized uh, in a mathematical way. It's called the Perturbational Complexity Index. It gauges the amount of information contained in the integrated response of the thalamocortical system to direct perturbation. Now, that's a mouthful, and I will unpack this for you so you understand what's going on. It's a very important measure that's increasingly being used in the study of patients with apparent loss of consciousness who nevertheless may be aware and may have conscious content. The next slide, you see uh, the stepwise procedure that is utilized in implementing this PCI, Perturbation Complexity Index. So you do a recording uh, of the brain's activity in response to a trans, uh, transcranial magnetic impulse. And you record the uh, cortical perturbation with a high-density EEG. 
So these are like 200 plus electrodes distributed over your scalp. Now then you capture the signal, the time series coming from all 200 plus electrodes and you model this in a, a, a specific statistical instrument that allows you to extract a matrix that describes the time series over these different electrodes. And here is now in number three the critical step. Any time series or any series of data can be simplified or compressed with an algorithm. In this case it's called the Lempel-Ziff complexity uh, algorithm. Uh, you know that when you use a zip file you can compress a large file into a much smaller size which is more easily transmitted over the internet and can be unpacked at the receiving end. Now data come in either high complexity or low complexity and the algorithm that condenses these files and shortens them in a way uh, will respond to the complexity inherent in the data. In fact it will it's, it allows you to generate a number that is called the complexity index. The more algorithmic complexity there is in the data set, the more work the ZIP, uh, the ZIP uh, algorithm has to do, the higher the complexity index is. So this then could be a potential gauge for the level of complex information in the EEG signal derived from patients in different states of consciousness. So the uh, PCI is expected to be of low uh, value when there is a loss of integration because in this case the matrix of activation engaged by TMS is spatially restricted and I showed you that the signal gets stuck right where the impulse is directed. It doesn't migrate. It will also be low if many interactions that occur down the road in different areas in the cortex are stereotypical. They have the same waveform over and over again and that will be called a loss of differentiation. So we have two items, a loss of integration and a loss of differentiation. These are important items to remember because we will get back to those when we discuss in our next lecture on consciousness the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness by Giulio Tononi, which is increasingly uh, drawing adherence to itself because it makes uh, specific predictions which can be tested by experiments and it is mathematically rigorous, which is the first uh, theory of consciousness ever to lend itself to mathematical treatment. Now in the next slide you see um, an application of this perturbation complexity index. Here you see the signals derived after a perturbation by TMS and you see here the matrix over the different electrodes and time periods involved and you see here you apply the left ziff compression algorithm and you wind up with a number called PCI in this case 0.5 Five. Now in the next slide, I show you the fine structure. If you go into a specific time slice and you blow it up to larger magnification, you see the inherent complexity that is not really visible in the raw data here. The algorithm will have more work to do to compress this data to reduce the inherent complexity. If you do the same thing in non-RAM sleep, i.e. in a non-conscious state, you see the signal is dramatically reduced and the complexity of course is significantly reduced as well yielding a smaller number for the PCI. So here's then a, uh, a test of all of this using different anesthetics. As you know anesthetics induce an unconscious state. So you would expect that the PCI should be low if you use this experimental procedure in the algorithmic compression and that's in fact what you see. In wakefulness the PCI hovers between 0.5 and 0.6 and all anesthetics here, midazolam, xenon and protofol, propofol are all significant lower as is 
as we discussed earlier, non-REM sleep. So this then is a experiment and a mathematical analysis of the experiment which uh, lets you verify predictions that your model makes about what is consciousness in the brain. So here now is the paper. Now this is a very recent vintage. We are now in uh, April of 2017. This just appeared a few weeks ago uh, in a major magazine here and it talks about increased spontaneous uh, uh, magnetic uh, encephalographic signal and it, the impact of uh, psychoactive drugs or uh, psychedelic drugs on this signal diversity, in other words on the complexity of the signal. Now in this experiment there is no transmagnetic stimulation because the authors feel that the disadvantage is that in the, in the uh, transmagnetic approach you need brain stimulation which limits is its practical application in the real world quite frankly because you need to hook patients up to a transmagnetic stimulation machine. So they have developed an approach where they measure signal diversity of spontaneous neuronal activity. Now I will not su subject you to the math and the different algorithmic kinds of things that need to be done to extract this, but the principle is the same as the one used in the previous papers that use transmagnetic stimulation as the perturbation uh, index of complexity. In the next slide uh, you can see the prediction LSD, psilocybin and anesthetic to sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine normally have profound and, uh, and widespread effects on conscious experience of the self and the world. More specifically they appear to broaden the scope of conscious content, vivifying imagination and positively modulating the flexibility of consciousness. Here are three papers that you can click on that will pop up the PDF files for these exciting research papers. So of course since the 60s there has been the, the claim that um, these drugs, these psychedelic drugs, expand consciousness. Uh, There's the famous quote by Huxley at the gate of perception, that the doors of perceptions are being opened by psychedelic drugs. And there may be a widening of consciousness and an increased sense of openness. In fact, there is often a change in the personality structure of uh, people who undergo a psychedelic experiences um, most pronounced in the domain of openness, openness to new experience, an increased flexibility of mind. And this has been attributed to a kind of reset button in the brain that leads to a more broader expanded consciousness uh, that is not available necessarily in the normal waking conscious state. And I'll show you only one slide with the overall result and that is right here. But before we get there, um, here is the description of the experiment. It's very straightforward. Uh, patients took uh, one of three drugs, LSD, psilocybin or ketamine, and um, then the complexity of uh, EEG channels is analyzed just as we discussed before. And the result here summarizes the entire story. What is shown here is the statistics of the Z complexity, the ZIF algorithm complexity mapped onto brain regions. So wherever the complexity is greater than in a control experiment you see red colors. For example in the psilocybin case here in the posterior cortex, you see a signal. In the uh, precuneus, you see a signal and some signal in the uh, medial frontal lobe. Same is true for LSD, but the signal, as you can see, is much more pronounced and much more widespread. And, to my surprise at least, ketamine 
seem to be the clear winner. So ketamine has a very extensive increase in complexity, not only in posterior region, but also anterior regions, medially and the entire cortex really as a whole. And now, as you know from previous lectures, ketamine is also a drug which leads to a very rapid antidepressant response, unmatched by anything else in psychiatry. And perhaps there is a linkage here between the broadening of complexity or the broadening of consciousness, the increased openness and flexibility of the mind to the putative antidepressant effect of ketamine. So this kind of experiment may lead the way to track the changes from a receptor such as the NMDA receptor to which ketamine binds, to increased amper firing in the brain, to neuronal circuits, and a theory that explains perhaps at the phenomena level as to what a resolution of depression might be, namely an unlocking of consciousness to a wider field and an opening of the personality. Uh, so here come pieces together that have not been stitched together by science as yet, but we may see the outline of where science might go. The other lesson that I see from this is that the way we approach the treatment of depression currently is probably misguided and largely ineffective. Perhaps we need to look towards the psychedelic type mechanism to give our patients more rapid and sustained relief. It's interesting to note that those changes induced by psychedelics often last for months or longer after a single psychedelic session. So this was our video blog number 10. We invite you to go back and review our lectures on consciousness and anticipate the release of our new lecture on the integrated information theory of consciousness, which will be forthcoming in the next week or so. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you soon again at Behavioral Health 2000.